Welcome to Uncommons. I'm Nate Erskine-Smith. The number one question on the minds of so many is how we return to school safely. It's stressful for parents, myself included, for kids, for teachers, for staff, and it should concern everyone else since a failure to open schools safely has the potential to increase community transmission and affect us all. Unfortunately, here in Ontario, the Ford government has done little, not nothing, but little, to address the issue despite months of notice and despite calls from experts for smaller class sizes, better ventilation, cohorting, outdoor schooling, and more. On this episode, I'm joined by experts and epidemiologists Ashley Chute and Amy Greer to discuss safe school opening, what parents should know, and what action governments should take. First, I'm joined by Professor Chute an infectious disease epidemiologist and mathematical modeler at U of T's School of Public Health. Ashley, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. So first, I have almost four-year-old who will be going or would be going to school for the very first time. And I'm in a bit of a unique situation in that my wife is on parental leave right now and is in parental leave in the fall because we have a younger one, a seven-month-old too. So it's not the same crunch time as it is for other parents. But as a parent of a young one potentially going to school in the fall, when you, you see the rollout of the $300 million from the province and the initial plan, but then also a subsequent announcement of another $50 million for ventilation and we're already nearing the end of August, how comfortable should parents be sending their kids back to school? I mean, first of all, the assumption is that there's a choice, right? And I think for a lot of families, there isn't a choice. They really have to send their kids back to school. Based on the levels of community transmission that are happening in Toronto, I would feel fairly comfortable sending my child to school right now, with the big caveat being that it really, really depends how the schools are set up. So we can do everything we can as a community to try and keep community transmission low. But once your child is in school, whether or not they're protected and whether you know you feel safe and comfortable with them being at school really, really depends on what, what, what measures are in place. So we know that there's been a lot of talk about class sizes, and I think that's a really big piece because, you know, we have all of this messaging and we've been listening to these messages for the past several months about the importance of maintaining physical distancing. And if you can't maintain physical distancing to wear a mask, keep group sizes low, have your, your, your social circle and don't extend beyond that. And when it comes to school, all of that messaging has been a little bit thrown out the window. People understand the messaging that we were getting. And so it, it can be confusing when we're talking about return to schools, why those precautions don't apply anymore. From a parental perspective, what you would want to see within the school setting is, you know, understand what the class sizes look like. How big is the class that your child is going to be in? Is there enough distance between people? If not, are there alternative arrangements in place? Is there a plan to have more education happening outside? Is there, you know, even if masks are not mandatory within the classroom, are, are children going to be encouraged to use masks, specifically younger children, because for them, they're not mandatory. As a parent, even if it's not mandatory, you can teach your child to use a mask and make them really comfortable with it. And I think that's a really prudent approach. So, you know, regardless of what's mandated, you can still take precautions individually to make yourself more comfortable with that return to school. And you make a really important point about choice and that many parents are in a situation where they have no choice. And so it, then it becomes incumbent on government to make parents comfortable, but make the schools safe. And the most important way of making schools safe is actually to make our communities safe and reduce community transition and eliminate as much as we reasonably can COVID-19 in our communities. But you also talk about engineering as the next hierarchy of hazards. And when you say class sizes, in early July, you had said, Avoiding the three C's, closed spaces, crowded places, and close contact situations seems to be a very good approach for avoiding situations where super spread events are likely to occur. But those three C's describe schools. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> this idea of making schools safe, you mentioned outdoors, you mentioned class sizes. I, I read in the Sick Kids plan that a number of countries have moved to 15. Is that a number that you would suggest as well? Yeah, that's the thing. You're, you're entirely right. We're basically the perfect storm in terms of where is this virus going to thrive is in a school setting because you have those closed spaces, crowded spaces, and close contacts, the number is really less important than the size of the classroom. So, you know, if you have a ginormous classroom, you can potentially have more students in there. 15 is being picked as a number because at least it's something to work towards. And I think it's easier to communicate than to say, well, you need X number of square meters per student. I think it's not a bad 
thing to aim towards. But again, there's nothing magical about that number. It's more about, you know, how can you set up a classroom in a way that ensures spacing and also makes it so that people can navigate the classroom. So that's something that we also have to think about is if you have a classroom where desks are spaced two meters apart, people still need to get in and out of the classroom. The teacher still needs to be able to move around the classroom. So that can be really tricky if you're sort of wall to wall desks and two meters between students. So it's, I think, logistically something that people need to sit down and plan and think about. And so much also depends upon time and dose. And if you are in a school setting for an extended period of time, regardless of physical distancing, unless you have proper ventilation, that is going to present its own challenge. And we've seen additional dollars for ventilation, but I'm trying to imagine what I know about the slow moving nature of government traditionally and infrastructure spending and and infrastructure completing these projects. How confident are you that we're going to see that $50 million spent in a useful way to expand schools or even in Toronto, the TDSB or other school boards accessing their cash reserves to do the ventilation work required? I I would be surprised if, if that's able to be done within the time frame required. To that point, BC has delayed their school opening. If you were advising David Williams and Premier Ford and Minister Lecce, they've put $300 million in place. They've then recognized additional dollars needed for ventilation. They've recognized that additional dollars may be needed to address online learning as well. When you look at class sizes, ventilation, cohorting, all as key components of engineering spaces to to make sure that they are safer. Are those the recommendations you would put to the government? Are there additional recommendations that you would make to make sure we open schools as safely as possible? If we could do those things and do them well, it would bring a lot of comfort to a lot of people. I mean, it's really these layered controls and having multiple interventions in place. That's what we want. I, I do think that, you know, we are in an a bit of an advantage right now in the sense that we do have nicer weather and I know Canadian winters can be tough but you know September October can be nice weather for me at least it's been a little bit frustrating or puzzling is why there hasn't been more of a push to think about outdoor education and what that would look like and, and you know not even just outdoor education but also you know using unused spaces so looking at offices or church basements or whatnot you know we know that space is something that we need and that would be very helpful right now so I guess that would be the one or two pieces that I would have hoped that we would have considered or thought about a little bit more and as a parent not an epidemiologist I was frustrated over the summer at the fact that with quite a significant time horizon for planning that there wasn't a greater conversation with community centers, churches, outdoor spaces to accomplish that physical distancing that is likely to be required because there is, up to, you know, legions. There are so many spaces I can think of up the, up the top of my head here in East Toronto, at least, and I know there are so many across Toronto that are underutilized right now that could be utilized for schools if we if we gave it that kind of thought. And it's going to be a challenge, obviously, to do that kind of thinking in such a short period of time. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, you know, one of the conversations that started early on during this pandemic is the fact that Canadians sort of see this as a a time for change and a time for innovation. And, you know, will society a year from now or three years from now look the way it looks now? And I really, really think that schools were one place where we could have made those changes early on and sort of thought about what's wrong with the way that school looks right now and are there ways that we can innovate that you know extend beyond the pandemic and I would say for me that's one source of frustration I guess a little bit of disappointment in the sense that I I did have this optimism that you know despite the fact that we're going through a really tough time right now we might come out the other side better and, and sort of more innovative and more thinking about these bigger societal issues and thinking about you know how do we solve them in ways that better serve everybody in the situation of schools thus far, it really hasn't been the case. Even with community transmission and the differential impacts upon different communities, more privileged communities see lower community transmission and therefore school reopening will be safer. And I don't know how perfect that calculation is, but I saw people plugging in different numbers and assessing what the risks are for different schools and different communities. And you can clearly see the differential impact depending upon the neighborhood. Absolutely. There are the neighborhood effects in terms of the risk of COVID entering the school. And then I think within the school, you're going to schools in different neighborhoods, you're going to see differences because the neighborhoods where parents have choices in terms of can they potentially keep their child home from school, those schools are going to have smaller class sizes. In other communities where that's not an option, you're going to have the more crowded classes, which is, you know, another element that's going to contribute to the likelihood of you seeing an outbreak. When we do see an outbreak in a school, 
You've also written about the need to support parents and families to ensure that they can keep their kids home and, and not sacrifice a paycheck and make sure we've got paid sick leave. But from an operational point of view, is it shutting down the whole class? Is it shutting down the school at some point? Do you have a view as to how those decisions get made? You know, if you sort of look at media and social media right now, there's there's so much anxiety and parents have so many questions and teachers have so many questions. And I think a lot of it relates to the fact that there just isn't clarity and there hasn't been a lot of planning. You know, if your child has symptoms, this is what you need to do. If there's a confirmed case in your class, you know, this is, we're going to tell you, we're not going to tell you, this is what you need to do as a parent. This is what your child needs to do. There hasn't been, as far as I've seen, any of that sort of communication. Any plan that we come up with is not going to be perfect, but I think having a plan to start is at least something to hold on to and something that I think would alleviate a lot of that anxiety for many people. I agree. Certainty in terms of the plan would alleviate anxiety. And I think too, just knowing that public health officials and the premier's office and the education minister's office are seized with the potential risks and have taken steps, clear steps to address those risks. Instead, when I heard David Williams say, well, if it was a risk, I would not recommend schools be reopened. And I thought, what a bizarre way of, of framing it, because obviously there is a risk mm -hmm. and there are a series of risks. And instead, the response should be, there are risks. We are reducing the risks where we can. And here are the steps we've taken to identify individual risks. And we're doing our best to mitigate those risks. And we do think it's safe given the measures that we put in place and given community spread. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think a lot of the challenge with the school reopening is, you know, first of all, there's the challenge of what are we doing and how are the resources being spent and have the boards been given enough latitude to, to come up with plans that work for them. But another big challenge is the communication and, you know, just making clear that everybody understands, you know, what we're doing, why we're doing it, you know, saying that there's no risk and, and, and minimizing that is not helpful. There, there are risks and there are, you know, there are obviously a lot of benefits with reopening schools, which is why we're pushing for that to happen. But at least being upfront about there are things that are going to happen when we open the schools. And these are the things that we're doing to, to mitigate those risks and to, to make sure that we have the processes in place and make sure that we're communicating that with students and educators and with parents, I think is a really important piece of this and I think it's a piece that's been lacking. What I can tell of your comments and what you've written previously as well, there ought to have been steps taken on cohorting, on class sizes that have not been taken to date. The ventilation piece is probably coming very late and it's unlikely we're going to get it perfect or in any ideal situation come the start of school. But where community spread is right now, because it's under 100 cases a day across Ontario, it's quite low and we have a fairly robust now testing tracing regime, still work to be done probably on supporting those folks in isolation. But because of where community spread is, a parent should be reasonably confident so long as community spread stays where it is sending their kids to school. I think so, yes. Yeah, with, with all of those caveats <laughs> that you mentioned. My last question is on testing because of the importance of elimination in communities generally for anything that we do safely, whether it's school reopenings or opening up businesses, opening up parliament, wh whatever it might be, low community tran transmission is essential. And to get there, we need strong testing, tracing, isolation, and support. And on the testing piece, Early on, I was quite frustrated. I was reading about the efforts in South Korea, drive-through testing, rapid results, and a bit frustrated that we weren't seeing the same kind of regime put in place here in Ontario and Canada. Now I read out of NBA-funded testing saliva tests, which means presumably that anyone can deliver the test, unlike the current test through the nose, which requires a health professional to deliver it. If that opens the door to non-health professionals to deliver the tests in a convenient way, and the folks at Yale who are behind the research have said it's open source, which means there's nothing that prevents us here in Canada from putting money into smart epidemiologists and R&D folks to make it happen on a, on a large scale, at the federal level, it makes me want to revisit this notion of testing. And can we blow the doors open and say, we've, yeah, we spent 200 and some odd billion dollars directly on supports for individuals and businesses. Well, if we spent even a fraction of that on testing, we would have to spend so much less on these other supports going forward because we would know our communities are safe. 
Am I, am I crazy for thinking that? No, I, I think you're right on. And I think the saliva tests and the rapid tests, which are two different things, are potentially game changing. The advantage of the saliva test is what you just said is anybody can do it. You basically need somebody to drool into a tube and you collect the drool, which is incredible because that really opens it up in terms of, you know, who can do this. And then, you know, there are the questions around the sort of rapid tests, which are tests that, you know, you can do sort of at the point that you collect the sample. And then there are other tests that use saliva but still have to go back to a lab. And so there's so, I think the turnaround times would be a little bit slower just because you still have to transport the samples. But both of those are game changing because it opens up who can get tested. It increases the speed at which people can get tested. And I think in settings like in schools, that would be incredibly, incredibly helpful. And a lot of the U.S. universities that are opening, and a lot of them are not opening because of the high rates of COVID that are, are transmitting right now, a, a huge part of those reopening campus plans include frequent testing. And the tests don't have to be perfect because the idea is you have a test that is less sensitive at detecting infection, but you do it more rapidly, you do it more frequently. And at the peak of infection, you know, if you're able to test somebody every day or every two days, you'll, you'll get them at the peak of their infection, potentially before they're symptomatic even. You know, if you're doing that at a large level, so like across the population, you can really shut down transmission potentially. So I do think getting those tests approved and, you know, figuring out how to deploy them large scale would, would really, really change the pandemic response in Canada. And if you were in my shoes, is that where you would be directing your advocacy efforts? I would, yeah. The technology is there. It's really just a matter of getting it approved and, and deploying it and scaling it up. Well, uh, thanks for the time. And I will, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how school reopening goes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. To continue this conversation, I'm next joined by Professor Greer. She's a Canada Research Chair in Population Disease Modeling at the University of Guelph, a professor also at U of T's School of Public Health, with previous scientific work in the Center for Communicable Diseases and Infection Control at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Amy, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me. I have a soon-to-be four-year-old this Saturday, actually, who would be going to kindergarten for the very first time. Now, I understand you have two kids, and they are young as well. Yes. And so you, with one hat, are an expert epidemiologist, and with another hat are a parent making these same difficult decisions that the rest of us are. What do you see as the challenges, risks, and the comfort level that parents ought to have in sending their kids back to school in Ontario right now? Yeah, I mean, this is an incredibly difficult question, and there's no perfect answer. Right? These are questions that I've been talking about with family and friends, talking about with my own graduate students. I have many graduate students who work in my team who are also parents who are in the same boat. And so we've talked a lot about, you know, what do the data say? What do the precautions that are currently in place look like? And how do we make decisions when there is no option that is zero risk? We are making the best possible decision at any given point in time. There's no option that's zero risk. And so with that in mind, I think there are a couple of things. Number one is that there's been a lot of talk about community transmission, right? So we know that keeping community transmission low is our best way to keep school as safe as possible. And so that means even if you're not a parent, even if you, you know, have no contact with the education system in this province, you have an important role to play. And that role is to do what you can to minimize transmission in the community by following the guidance that's been put out. That includes, you know, hand hygiene, staying home when you're sick, maintaining physical distancing, wearing a mask when you're in indoor settings or unable to maintain physical distancing. So, you know, all of that messaging still applies. First order of business, we have to keep community transmission low. In a low community transmission situation, which um, we have managed to continue to reduce cases in the province, and that's really good news. We do still have cases. You know, this, this virus has not gone away, and I think that's also important to remember. And what we're seeing is that we're seeing cases in younger age groups. And so, you know, those younger age groups are not individuals who are then subsequently being admitted to ICU, right? So we're not seeing massive surges in our healthcare capacity right now. As we head into fall, you know, we expect that transmission is going to increase. So schools have implemented a variety of, of ways in which they have proposed they are going to keep 
the school setting as safe as possible. I think certainly some of those things that they have put in place are useful from an infection prevention and control standpoint. Some of them are things that make me uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable that we are talking about sending kids back to school in full class sizes because if you've ever been in an elementary or high school in this province in a classroom, it is not possible to maintain two meters of physical distance and have that full class capacity. And so to me, that really seems like a challenge. Like you can't have one, you can't have full class size and also have good physical distancing. So if we're going to go back at full class size, then those kids are going to have contact with one another. And that opens up transmission risk. So again, you know, every family is going to have to make a risk calculation. A part of that is going to be based on your own household risk tolerance. If a member of your household is immunocompromised, or if you live in a multi-generational household, and so grandparents are a part of your household, they would be at much higher risk for having, you know, really severe illness if they were to, to contract this virus. So, you know, you may have a lower risk threshold and may say, we're not comfortable with the risk that in-person school represents for our own household or our own bubble, if you will. I said to constituents who were asking me, because they know I've got a, a young kid and I had responded to some of their concerns by way of email to identify this as a provincial issue, to, but to say I, I share their concerns. And I had indicated the importance of community transmission and that community transmission is low. So while there ought to be additional steps on engineering, so class sizes or administrative controls like moving kids outdoors as much as reasonably possible in the fall when the weather is still warm enough, and engineering controls on ventilation, where transmission is at today, one ought to be reasonably confident about sending kids back to school. But then you and Ashley have written with, I think David as well, David Fisman, if reopening of schools and reuniting families and caregivers with long-term care residents is to be prioritized, we may have to forego the reopening of indoor bars and restaurants as concurrency of these activities is likely to substantially increase transmission. And then my caveat to constituents is to say, if community transmission is as low in early September or mid-September as it is today, and I can't with great confidence, knowing what we know about the phase that we're in, say that it's going to be there. And do you worry about the quick reopening of non-school locations when school ought to really be the priority? Yeah, I worry about it a lot, to be honest. We know that um, there are examples, and for instance, we just received an email earlier this week, and Ashley may have mentioned it, from colleagues in Korea, where they're a little bit ahead of us. They opened some of those, what we would call congregate settings. So indoor settings where people come to and congregate. So, you know, bars, restaurants, clubs. So they, in their reopening, had moved into the phase where they were opening those types of indoor settings. And they have since seen quite significant significant resurgence in transmission in the community such that they are currently talking about having to scale back to phase two very soon or immediately. I think that indoor spaces represent a real challenge. I think that right now we're getting a bit of an assist from summer, right? Which is that it is easy for us to have some sense of normalcy, even if it is physically distanced, because we can visit people outdoors. We can visit outdoors and we can keep two meters of distance and we can wear masks uh, when we're not able to do that. But we know that those types of interactions are lower risk. As we head into fall, people are going to start moving back indoors. Businesses are going to start to have at least some employees returning to their offices. And that's going to represent a real challenge to transmission. And I think it would be unreasonable to assume that transmission will continue to stay low. It just, it seems impossible because we know that what drives transmission is contact rate and the probability of transmission given a contact. We can do things to influence those two parts of the puzzle. Like we can wear masks when we're indoors and we know that that's beneficial, but ultimately at the scale of the province, we are going to see upticks in transmission as people start moving back indoors. And it's likely going to start with school. And of all of the settings that we could be opening, there are some that are obviously more important than others. And I speak not only as a parent, but also someone concerned about a quality of labor force participation and fairness for people from different segments of our society who may not be able to afford 
keeping their kids at home, it is a challenge if we don't prioritize schools. And it doesn't seem like in the reopening plans we have. And if we are going to reopen other things at the same time, then all the more reason to double down on efforts, spend significant money for ventilation to find additional spaces, to reduce those class sizes, to look at stronger cohorting plans. And I, I don't know, I kind of throw up my hands a little bit at the federal level and with frustration and say, we've spent 200 and some odd billions of dollars in direct support for individuals and families and, and businesses. Couldn't you have got the damn school reopening right? It's very frustrating and even more frustrating as a parent. I imagine it's frustrating as a parent and, and an epi epidemiologist at the same time. It is a struggle because I think educators have really great insight, right? Teachers and the educators who work in this province know their work environment the best. To me, it seems like in March, we were already talking about really good plans for going back to school in a way that would be as low risk as possible. And that includes smaller cohorts. So for instance, if we want to put kids into smaller groups, there was a lot of talk about, okay, well, if we're going to have class sizes that are half, we don't have enough space to do that. What we'll have to do is we'll have to have kind of like this hybrid school where half the kids come one day and then they do remote the next day and then half the kids come the next day. You know, as a working parent, that, that type of scheduling is really challenging. I mean, you know, many employers are not going to be flexible enough to say, oh, sure, you know, you can work from home certain days. And, you know, the scheduling was really problematic. And we knew that was going to be the case. We knew that was going to be the case in March. We knew smaller groups of kids were going to be lower risk. You know, the idea of thinking creatively at the level of communities to say, how do we get more space? You know, if the limitation here is just space, how do we do that? Do we spread out into church basements and community centers and places so that we can have everybody who wants to be here and we can have them in smaller groups. There was really amazing discussion of creative ways to do that that were actually not exceptionally costly. And yet we're three, less than three weeks out from the start of school now. And, you know, all of a sudden we're going to update all of the HVAC in every school. I mean, our kids' school does not have air conditioning. I mean, the windows don't open. It is sweltering in there. Our kids come out at the end of the day in September and they are dripping in sweat. So I just, I cannot comprehend <laughs> Like the logistics of all of this is so challenging. And I feel like we've had so much time to work with teachers and boards to come up with a good plan. And it just feels like, what have we been doing? And seeing what BC has done to say, let's take a bit more time. Let's not rush this. Let's get it right. As they've seen community transmission increase. Would you favor that approach here in Ontario, given where we're at? Or would you say, because of community transmission where it is, let's continue to discuss these things, but it's, it's safe enough to open in early, mid-September. I mean, I think there's still a lot of lack of clarity that is both on the side of the public health kind of infection control part of this, right? So, you know, I get asked frequently, you know, how are, how are we as parents at, at my kid's school, you know, how am I going to screen my child? Like, what are the screening requirements? Because we've said we're, every parent is going to screen their kid every day and they have to pass the screening to be able to go to school. Well, you know, what does that look like? Well, you know, that document does not exist yet. Okay, so what happens if you have a kid who is feeling unwell? Well, we don't have a document for that. What happens if a kid tests positive? Does the whole class move to remote until 14 days have passed? Are families notified? Are they not notified? Like, what does any of that look like? It's very unclear to me because I haven't seen any plans. And I know that boards are working with their local public health units. So, so there's a lot of work, like an insane amount of work currently happening between local school boards and their local public health medical officers of health to do that and get it in place. But that's a lot of work. You know, the plan was only rolled out publicly like a week ago. So it just to me seems like we have to have time to get all of this in place. And I also think, you know, from the perspective of teachers, you know, they don't know whether they will be teaching in a classroom or online. They don't know what their specific situation is. And when they return to the classroom, there will be a very small window of time. You know, there are going to be new protocols and policies like as a team they're really going to need to spend some time together as a staff to get this working right so that they can kind of get 
a groove of, of how this is going to work because it's going to be very different. And I think throwing them in for, you know, one or two days of the days before school starts and then saying, okay, now let's just start seems, seems a bit wild to me. And while we didn't know everything in March, we certainly knew enough to have focused on reducing class sizes and looking at cohorting and, and done, done some of that preparatory work. But we also know more now than we did before. And I had previously heard some voices say, well, kids are not community spreaders. They're not at the same risk. And then I saw an article that you shared from the Medical Journal of Australia that said children are more susceptible than originally thought and do play a role in community transmission and seroprevalence and contact tracing studies show children are similarly vulnerable and transmit the virus to a meaningful degree, which throws a wrench in that previous conversation significantly and really causes, I think, great concern, not only about one's immediate household, but if something happens at the school, whether in my kid's classroom or my kid's school, more broadly, is it then safe to spend time with my mom and my grandmom alongside my four-year-old? It's hard to navigate those conversations too, knowing more and more about transmission through kids. Yeah, and I mean, I think those are the conversations that are happening right now. And and I know that there are teachers and, and also parents who say, for instance, you know, I have a, a parent who is older, you know, and I'm a teacher, because of the contact and exposure I am potentially having, I am not going to feel comfortable having visits with my parents in person. You know, we will have to revert back to Zoom calls and physically distanced visits and all of those sorts of things because I am concerned that I could be a risk to them and they are at higher risk of having something bad happen to them if they get this virus. And so I think all of that is is a really big question. And you know, the role of kids in transmission, I think there is still significant uncertainty. And the challenge is that we have been doing a really good job of protecting kids from exposure by closing schools. And so, you know, a lot of the talk about kids are not susceptible, but they weren't given opportunities to be infected because we kept them home. And we were doing a really good job of sheltering them you know, because playgrounds were closed, places where they could go to to interact with other people. They were only staying in their homes. And so it's really hard to say. There are so many biases that exist in the scientific data that were collected because they were collected under very unusual circumstances, right? Not under normal conditions. And so personally, I feel as though I would much prefer to err on the side of caution and perhaps slightly overreact. If it turns out that young kids for whatever magical reason, don't transmit as much as an adult, then great. But I mean, I personally would prefer that we assume that the possibility is there and we should act as though it was the case that it is possible and take every measure possible to minimize risk under that assumption. And when we think of advice for the province, I've read the SICKIS plan, I've, I've, I've read your work and Ashley's work, and there are a lot of common themes about reducing class sizes and ventilation, and there are clear steps that the province ought to take in partnership with the school boards. There are some other challenging instances, and I read a STAR article about before and after school care. In my conversations with our local trustee, she identified transport, and I, I didn't really see a clear solution to transportation issues. And then my parents were both teachers. And my mom has said to me, what are we doing with supply teachers? Because they're moving oh, in between I schools. And I, I, there are some seemingly intractable problems that I don't even know how one would sit down to resolve. Yeah. I mean, the supply teacher thing is something that I have been bringing up over and over again, because we know that in the long-term care setting, right? When we had outbreaks in long-term care that started, you know, those long-term care outbreaks kind of started in BC because that's where they initially had kind of the preliminary early cases. One of the risk factors for long-term care outbreaks was healthcare workers who worked in multiple facilities, right? Because they might work part-time at facility A and they work part-time at facility B. And so they move, so they, they generate a bridge between two different communities. And that allows for a, a pathogen to potentially spread more easily than if they're kind of distinct independent units for which there is no bridge. The idea of having supply teachers who are moving between schools, and I, and I think it is reasonable to assume that we need to be planning for high absenteeism. We don't want people coming to work 
if they're having any sort of symptom that might suggest that they have COVID-19. And that's gonna be really hard in the fall, right? Because kids go back to school and they get every sniffle and cough and prolonged cough illness. They get all of these things. When my kid first went to daycare, I was like, holy shit, he's sick all the time. I know. And so, you know, the challenge is that how are we going to tell, right? We're not going to have all those people get tested every time they get a sniffle, but we can't risk them being in the classroom. And so we have to plan for rates of high absenteeism. We have to support teachers to make decisions that allow them to not be penalized for saying, hey, I have a cough. I cannot be in the school until I am certain that this isn't going to turn into something else. That means we're going to need supply teachers. We are going to need people who are able to cover that. And having them move between schools as a bridge is the same thing we saw in long-term care, right? As uh, in terms of, of bridging different groups of individuals. They're going to wash their hands. They're going to wear a mask. They're going to do all of those things. But ultimately, it still represents a risk. It's riskier than if we had supply teachers who were themselves cohorted to specific or smaller groups. And we know that there are other staff, right? Speech and language pathologists come in and out of schools, psychologists, you know, no school has dedicated resources for all of those additional supports that many kids access through school. And so we really kind of also need to think about that. And there's been a lot of talk around delivery of some of those other types of subjects, right? So French, if your child is not in French immersion, they would have one period of French. And that would be with a French teacher who moves between classes. And, you know, I've talked with some schools about, you know, the fact that in the Ontario plan, that appears to, to be continuing as per usual. So we're generating bridges between cohorts, if you will, by virtue of having people move between the groups. And that's problematic. It increases risk. Certainly, we're going to take precautions to minimize the risk that that is a potential vector for transmission. I've talked with some schools that have said, well, you know, maybe we could cohort for some of those special subjects. So I mean, I think there are other ways, but the logistics, again, even within a single school, the logistics of trying to do that is going to require that you have the staff back at work, that you have time to kind of work out the kinks of like, how do you navigate all of these moving parts? Bottom line for parents and for teachers and for kids, I think, but add, add your bottom line if it deviates in any way whatsoever, but is people can be reasonably confident with returning to school so long as community transmission stays where it is or is less than what it is today. But still, we ought to demand clearer plans from provinces and school boards laying out the considerations that we need the answers to in sending our kids back to school. And then we ought to demand action to address outstanding risks that haven't been sufficiently mitigated. So that's ventilation, that's additional teachers in additional spaces, that's cohorting if necessary. And from the federal government's perspective, that's potentially leaning in and supporting provinces with additional dollars if they need it. Maybe also at the federal level, additional efforts on testing and tracing where provinces need it as well. We would be naive to think that we will not see school outbreaks. Given the way in which the plan is currently laid out, I expect that there will be school outbreaks. How long that takes to start to happen is a bit unclear. But even if we have school outbreaks, we know that we have public health infrastructure. So local public health units are going to manage those outbreaks. And they're going to work very hard to make sure that before you kind of get the forest fire of outbreak, that you get in there early and that you contain whatever you have as kind of like a spot, right? So you, you contain that little flare up before it becomes a big problem. That is to be expected. I think parents need need to know that that is a possibility. And again, they have to think about what their own household risk threshold is for the potential for that. Versus the necessity in some cases of sending one's kids back to school. So where someone has the choice, they can start to assess that calculus and assess maybe community transmission within their own respective community and look at the school board's specific plans and whether they've mitigated risk in addition to what the province has done. And, and then make those individual calls based upon their own risk levels within their household and bubble. I mean, I think that's true, but I also think we need to recognize the fact that that in itself is a privilege, right? Being able 100%. to assess your, your household risk tolerance and to even be able to say, oh, you know, we won't send our kids. I mean, that is a privilege that the vast majority of people 
do not have. I think it is on us to demand that the plan be improved because we owe it to every family for whom that is not a possible option. Um, and it doesn't matter if you can keep your kids home. I mean, that's not the end of the story. You do that if that's what you need to do. But I still think, you know, we have to advocate for public education and we have to advocate for safe public education and we owe it to the people for whom that is the only option. And I think, you know, bowing out of the discussion and the argument now, just if you're going to say, well, you know, for us, it's too risky, that's not acceptable either, personally. I couldn't have said it better myself. I think coming from a family where both my parents were teachers and living through the public education system and looking to now send my own kids through the public education system, I can't imagine us not prioritizing this. And I just, I'm at a bit of a loss to understand how we have come to this point where we haven't as a society provincially, and I, and I don't even only point to this provincial government, although I don't think that they adequately support public education as an ethos, but across the country, I, I don't think we have done what has needed to be done since the spring when we knew what we knew to put us in a place to succeed and for all parents and kids to succeed and teachers to succeed. And so I, I you know, I share that frustration. And I think the, the better bottom line is then to demand a better plan and to demand better resourcing so all parents can be comfortable with whatever the outcome is. Yeah. All right. Well, Amy, I really appreciate your time. I am only good at this job insofar as I rely upon people much smarter than me, and you are certainly one of those people. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out going forward, and I may be back in touch as, as I continue advocacy on testing in particular at the federal level. I may be back in touch and pick your brain. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for joining me on this episode of On Commons. Thanks, of course, to Ashley and Amy for their time and their public advocacy in support of stronger health measures and keeping our schools safe. If you're a parent, a teacher, a staff member, if you feel strongly about a safe school opening and you are concerned about the planning, the lack of planning to keep our schools safe this fall, make sure you reach out to Premier Ford's office and make your voice heard. Now is the time. We need additional action to keep our schools safe.